So I was gonna do something totally different for you all this week, but then Pokemon Go happened. I think it's a legitimate digital phenomenon and is gonna be remembered as a turning point in the history of mobile gaming. Pokemon Fever is as strong now as it was just a few weeks ago, so instead of what I was gonna do, today we're gonna try a little bit of in-game Poke Science. In case you haven't been online in the last two weeks, Pokemon Go is the latest game from Nintendo and the latest Pokemon game from the Pokemon Company. It uses a combination of geographical locations, augmented reality, and community goals to encourage players all over the world to wander across the land, searching far and wide for Pokemon to add to their collection. But how does the game work? Well, I think a bit of science and geometry can help us get our heads around it and maybe catch some sweet, sweet mounds in the process. Pika! We'll start with the technology flow above you thousands of miles above your head and end with how to catch Pokemon that are just a few paw prints away. Pokemon Go starts in outer space. Pokemon Go knows where to spawn Pokemon and where you are thanks to the wonders of GPS, or our Global Positioning System. It was started by the United States back in the 60s for the military and officially launched in 1995. Right now, there are 32 of these Global Positioning System satellites orbiting above us at around 20 thousand kilometers above our heads. Each one weighs around 1,600 kilograms, and they are orbiting around the Earth at a velocity of up to 14,000 kilometers per hour. This speed is uh, huge and will be very important later. These spacecraft find you based on complicated maths and electronics, but we can simplify it to spheres, you know, something like a Voltorb. So to find out how far you are from a GPS satellite, a receiver like your phone starts comparing the difference in time between the signal that it is generating and an identical signal that the GPS satellites are sending out. If you divide that time difference by the speed of light, how fast those signals are traveling, you get a distance. That's how far away you are. Now for the spheres. If you are X distance away from a satellite, you could be at any point theoretically on this sphere around a satellite. But what if you add two more satellites to your receiver? If you add two more satellites, then theoretically you could be at one of two points at the intersection of all the sphere's surfaces. But what if you add just one more so that your receiver can see in the sky to your phone four total satellites. Then, theoretically, you can only be on one of those two points that you found. From this, the intersection of the surfaces of these four spheres, you can get your position in three-dimensional space and the correct time based on the atomic clocks in the GPS satellites, which correct for relativity. That's right, GPS satellites orbit so quickly that we need Professor Einstein to help us catch Pokemon, not Professor Daddy, I mean Willow. The geometry of circles can also help you catch Pokemon in the game. N nice, nice toss. Yeah, that curveball is really working out for you. Yeah, you, you know, I love raspberries. You gotta use ras... I just got that. Now we don't know how exactly publisher Niantic is spawning Pokemon, but self-proclaimed Pokemon scientists, the Silk Road, claim that the Pokemon types themselves are correlated to atmospheric conditions like temperature and humidity and time of day, and also the physical location, so you're more likely to catch a Magikarp at the beach. But when you do see Pokemon on your radar, you know that menu that kind of looks like this when you pull it up from the bottom right? You can use the geometry of concentric circles to catch them. We also aren't sure of the map that Niantic uses to get you to a Pokemon, but I have tested this method popularized by Redditor, the colorless pill, and I think it's more or less correct. So, let's imagine ourselves on a giant two-dimensional plane, and there's a Pokemon on it, but it's at the center of concentric circles, each with an increasing number of paw prints. Now, here's the trick. Pick a Pokemon on your radar and start walking. What we're trying to do is describe two points on the circumferences of one of these circles. The reason we're doing that is because if you go to the midpoint on any segment of a circle and you draw a perpendicular or 90 degree straight line, it will always go through the center. In practice, we have to use this with the one or two paw print circles because there's no number for the paw prints outside of three. So, let's imagine that you are three paw prints away and you start walking. When you first decrease from three to two, mark that point down in your head. Now, keep walking. If you go from now two to one, 
that's great. Keep walking, you might hit the Pokemon, but if you're not going to find the Pokemon this way, you're gonna increase back from two to three, and when you finally do increase back from two to three, mark that point down in your head. Now you have a segment. Turn around, go back to the midpoint of that segment. Now turn 90 degrees and go one or two directions along this line, and mathematically the Pokemon has to be somewhere on this line. So go get it. Don't believe me, believe the math. This method works for any path. Up, oh, Pokemon rhyme. Hopefully this gives you a little bit of pokey perspective. Math orbiting at thousands of kilometers above our heads lets us use math and geometry to catch uh, the Charmander that it says is right, yep, and it's frozen. So use science to your advantage when playing Pokemon Go. Just be safe out there because I care about you. Yep, yep, that's how this episode's ending. Thank you so much for watching. No Pokemon evolves. That's not what evolution is. Evolution is a gradual change over many, many generations of some population of animals based on what's selected to work from the environment acting on random genetic mutations. That's not what happens when a Bulbasaur goes to a Venusaur. That's more of a metamorphosis like you'd see in a butterfly changing within one lifetime from one form to another. A butterfly lick, goes into, goes, goes into you know, its, its little hibernation and then it liquefies its own body and its organs and then they know to rebuild itself from this soup into something different and wonderful and lovely and what was I talking about? <laughs> Told you.